The last topics we're going to cover this year involve studying um, energy changes that happen in chemical processes. All right, so this year we've spent time looking at the law of conservation of mass and matter. And we haven't really looked at the law of conservation of energy. This law, my, probably many of you have explored it in your physics class because it's a very important theme. And to review what that law says, because any law of conservation means the same thing, is that nothing can be created or destroyed in the process. So this law relates to energy. So when a chemical process is happening, energy can change form, but it can't be created or destroyed. So for example, um, when you turn on the lights, um, you take electrical energy, and that's converted into light energy and heat. So we do need to make sure that we're using the same vocabulary when, when we're describing energy, and we're going to look at some of these terms from a chemistry perspective. Um, kinetic energy is related to the motion of an object. When chemists talk about kinetic energy, they're talking about the motion of molecules, and those molecules that energy can be rotational, vibrational, or um, in a straight line. When we talk about potential energy, chemists add the, add the word ch um, chemical in front of that. Because energy is energy due to position, or sorry, potential energy is energy due to position. But when we're talking about chemical potential energy, it's the energy that are stored up that's stored up in the bonds of a substance. Um, heat is a, reflects the transfer of thermal energy, and it flows between um, objects that have different temperature, from warmer to colder. Colder. When chemists talk about thermal energy, they're talking about the total kinetic energy of all of the particles in a system. And thermal energy does increase with temperature. It's represented with the symbol Q, as is shown right here. The units for that are joules. So we've used those units before this year. And there's a formula here. And it should say Q is equal to mc delta t. Um, and we'll get into that formula a little bit more later. Delta by meaning change in. And the last term that we talk about, that we need to talk about, is temperature. And what temperature actually measures is the average kinetic energies of the, of the particles of a system at a given moment in time. So when chemists talk about um, energy changes or describing changes in energy, they use the terms exothermic and endothermic. And we represent these processes using with what's called a reaction profile, and that's what both of these diagrams are showing. Reaction profiles tell us, give us a way to track energy. So in an exothermic, which is this one right here, change, it's where energy is released to the, chemo to the surroundings. So heat energy is released to the surroundings. And the materials in themselves have a decrease in chemical potential energy. So in other words, the reactants are at a higher level of energy than the product. And we'll talk about what this delta H is in a little bit and what its sign means. Um, in an endothermic process, it's a change where chemical energy enters the system. So in other words, the surrounding environment loses energy to the chemical reaction or the process happening. So in this case, there's energy getting stored up in chemical bonds to be used later. So the products have um, higher energy than the reactants. And in this case, we'll be looking at, it looks at delta H again. This time it's positive, and we'll talk about what that delta H means. So I did say that we would talk about energy in physical processes, and this is probably all that we're going to do with that, um, is look at what's going on. So when we're looking at phase changes here, we're looking at two different kinds of curves. You're looking at what's called, a, you're looking at a heating curve, and you're looking at a cooling curve. This one is a heating curve. And heating curves and cooling curves always follow the same pattern. Um, you plot temperature versus time, and you what's going on is phase change, so a substance is going from a solid to a liquid to a gas, or from a gas to a liquid to a solid. And you should notice that they're the exact opposite of each other. So as temperature increases, we'll look at the heating curve, and goes the, the solid's temperature is increasing. And this point right here is right where it starts to melt. This plateau is where all of melting is happening, so you have two states of matter combined there. And the temperature isn't changing because what's going on is you are adding energy to overcome what's called the heat of fusion. And heat of fusion is what's holding the solid together, the energy that helps hold the solid together. Once all of the solid has melted, turns into liquid, 
And that point on the curve right there is the liquid heating. This point right here is the boiling temperature. So you have a mixture of liquid and gas at that point. And again, you notice a plateau. That's because all of the energy that is being added is going to changing the substance's state, so vaporizing it. Okay. Once all of the substance has been vaporized, the gas can be heated. Okay. So the cooling curve is exactly the same, it's just these po the points are different. So it's instead of being heat of va vaporization, it's heat of condensation, and it would be heat of fusion right here. All right, so there's three factors that affect the amount of heat energy in a, in a system. And we did say that we calculate heat energy using the formula Q is equal to MC delta T. And the factors that affect it are mass, specific heat capacity, and temperature. Mass, we know, is the amount of matter in an object. Specific heat capacity depends on what the substance is. But what it is, is the amount of heat energy needed to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. And delta T is temperature change. Okay, so when we're thinking about heat capacity, um, it's basically how easy or hard something is to heat up. So water actually takes a lot of energy to heat up, so it has a pretty high specific heat capacity value. And that number right there that I just circled and underlined is important, so we'll be coming back to and using that. All right, so now we're going to look at how do we measure the amount of heat energy in a system. And we use a lab technique called calorimetry. And this technique uses, actually, there's, there can be very sophisticated calorimeters and there can be pretty simple ones. Um, ones can be as simple as a couple of nested foam cups, like this one shows. Um, you have foam cups. The foam cup on the inside has a certain amount of water added to it. Um, you have a lid on the cups, and you have a thermometer. You don't always have this stirrer, so it may or may not be there. But um, that's really as simple as a, as a calorimeter, calorimeter is. But what you do are doing is you're monitoring energy transfers between the chemical system and the surrounding water by measuring the temperature of the water. And we'll be doing a couple of labs that use this technique. So here's another type of calorimeter in this one, this is a, what's called a constant volume or a bomb calorimeter. And in a bomb calorimeter, um, it's done in the presence of oxygen under high pressure. And the heat released warms water that's in this chamber in here. And again, you can use that to calculate how much heat energy was involved in the reaction. Bomb calorimeters would be used for food calories. So food calorie determination. Now, so if you took experimental bio last year, you probably did some, or I know you've done some calorimetry. Um, so something along, you, and you've used actually constant volume ones. You didn't use a bomb calorimeter, but you used one that works analogously to this. Okay, so what we're looking at here is measuring enthalpy changes in um, water solutions. Now, when we talk about enthalpy, enthalpy, or enthalpy, actually, is the heat content, and I know this was on the last slide, but I didn't cover it. It's the heat content of a system at constant pressure. Okay, so it is covered on the last slide, that definition. So, um, in other words, to measure the heat content, um, here's what you need to do. So you're going to take the chemicals, you're going to take... Um, dissolve them in known volumes of water. You're going to measure the starting temperature of each solution and mix them together in a foam cup. You're going to allow them to react and then you're going to measure the final temperatures. And you can use initial and final temperature and the specific heat capacity of water to figure out how much heat was absorbed by the surroundings. And we're going to set that equal to, so the energy of the system is equal to enthalpy change, which is delta H, which is heat lost by the surroundings or the opposite of um, negative mc delta t. Okay, so we're going to do a problem example here. Okay, so when we look at this problem, um, this problem says when 25 grams of water containing 0.025 moles of HCl at 25 degrees Celsius is added to 25 grams of water containing 0 0.025 moles of sodium hydroxide, at 25 degrees Celsius in a foam cup, a reaction occurs. This is actually the reaction, HCl plus NaOH makes NaCl plus H2O. 
Okay, so there's the reaction that happens. So what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the enthalpy change in kilojoules during this reaction if the highest temperature observed is 32 degrees Celsius. So um, the first thing that we need to do is we need to find our total mass of water. And we find that by going to the question and 25 grams of water there and 25 grams of water here. So it's 25 plus 25 or 50 grams. Okay. Um, now we can actually do use the formula EQ is equal to MC delta T. Okay. So mass we just figured out is 50. C is the specific heat capacity of water, which is given to you earlier, but it, just to refresh your memory, it is 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. And our temperature change is the final temperature is 32, the initial temperature was 25. So to figure out how much heat energy was released during this reaction, and it's released because the temperature goes up, it's 50 times 4.18 times 7, and that will give you 1,463 joules. Okay. Now, the sign of this is negative, though, actually, because remember, it's minus there. So the enthalpy change is negative 1,463 joules. And that negative sign is telling me that energy was released to the surroundings. So that's what the negative sign tells you. All right, so we're going to look at another example of a calorimetry type problem. So this one's a little bit different. This one says when you have a 4.25 gram sample of solid ammonium nitrate and you dissolve it in 60 grams of water, the temperature drops. So this is um, going to be an endothermic reaction or endothermic process. And it's endothermic because the temperature goes down. But the temperature drops from negative, or, sorry, drops from 21 to 16.9. And we're calculating the total heat change, again, so the enthalpy for this process, or the enthalpy. So here's what we know. We know that we have 60 grams of water. We know that specific heat capacity is wa of water is 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. Um, and we know that the temperature change was from 21, so T, sorry, T, sorry, the change in temperature is 21 minus 16.9. Okay. So we also should know that um, the enthalpy change is going to be positive in this case. So remember it's minus. So Q is equal to the opposite of MC delta T. So minus 60. 4.18, and our delta T is actually 16.9, sorry, minus 21. So T final minus T initial. So when you do that, you find out that Q is equal to 1,000.28.28 joules. Now, problem is, is that is for the 4.25 gram sample. So we need to know how many what would that be for a mole of ammonium nitrate? So here's how we figure that out. So we got to convert the 4.25 grams to moles. One mole of um, ammonium nitrate has a mass of about 80.04 grams. So that gives us 0.053 moles. Okay. So we have 1,028.28 joules for 0.053 moles. Okay, so when you do that, for one mole, it would be 1,000, sorry, 19,401.5 joules. Now, when we go to represent these enthalpy changes in chemical reactions, we're, they're either going to be represented as a reactant or a product. And these are actually called, not just a chemical equation anymore, when you add the enthalpy, ch or the enthalpy change, it's what's called a thermochemical equation because you're including energy representations. Okay. Whoops. Thermochemical equation. 
So, and in other times, people will use describe enthalpy as heat of reaction. Okay, so a couple of examples here. Exothermic reactions, we did just talk about, do release energy to the surroundings. So heat is released as a product. So in this case, when you're representing an exothermic process, the heat of reaction appears as a product. Endothermic reactions absorb energy from the surroundings, so heat's needed for that reaction to actually occur. So we represent heat of reaction as a reactant. Now, sometimes we can use, or we can use, heats of reaction to, um, to figure out enthalpy changes. So we're going to look at an example here, and right over here is details about the most complicated these things could get. So what you might have to do is balance a chemical equation, convert an amount of reactant information that's provided. Maybe it was given to you in grams. You might have to convert that to moles. You're going to have to use the heat of reaction information that's provided, um, along with dimensional analysis, to figure out what the problem is asking you to do. So we're going to work our way through this example. So conveniently, the example I gave you has a balanced equation, but it does say use the equation below to figure out how much heat energy is released when 6.44 grams of sulfur reacts with excess oxygen, so extra oxygen according to the following equation. So the equation is balanced, so that one check. We do have to convert the amount of reactant information that was provided to moles. Well, we know that we have 6.44 grams of sulfur, so that should be our first step, is to figure out how many moles of sulfur is that. 6.44 grams, one mole of sulfur has a mass of 32.07 grams, okay, and that gives us um, 0.2 moles, okay, so we're going to need that. Okay. Now, so when I look back at this equation here, I see that for 2 moles of sulfur, 791.4 kilojoules of energy are released. So here's how we're going to use the dimensional analysis. So for 791.4 kilojoules are released for every 2 moles. Now, I didn't burn 2 moles of sulfur. I burnt 0 0.2 moles. So notice that my moles are going to cancel. So to get the right answer here, I'm going to say 791.4 times 0.2 divided by 2, and you're going to get 79.46 kilojoules of energy are released when you burn that amount of sulfur. Okay, so what you should come to class prepared to do is apply information from this note packet. There will be some questions that you'll need to answer about exothermic and endothermic processes, and there will also be some problems to solve with examples very similar to what, we, um, what I covered in this lecture.